According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me once again, if you would. We've got a uh, new uh, word to start looking at this morning, and so we're going to be in Judges, Judges chapter 5. <coughs> Judges chapter 5. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Judges chapter 5. I think in the process of teaching on angels, we're going to hit all 66 of our books of the Bible. I'm not aware of a book that does not have some kind of reference to uh, the angelic conflict, one way or the other. Uh, in any event, some of the smaller epistles you say, well, there's, where are the angels in 3 John? Or where are the angels in Jude? Oh, wait a minute. All right. Yeah, there's angelic conflict. If not angels directly, then indirectly we can find angelic conflict information in every book of Scripture. Before we begin, let's take a moment for silent prayer to make sure that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we are hedged about with protection. The demons are raging. They don't like this stuff getting taught. So let's uh, ask the Father to bless our study today, shall we? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. It is our privilege and blessing to assemble together this morning. We ask for your hand of faithfulness upon us. Open the eyes of our understanding. We thank you, Father, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we are ready for main point 13. Hope no one's superstitious. Uh, we, uh, on Wednesday night, we're still dealing with our uh, Hebrew and Aramaic terms. So if you are following the outline, we're still in the midst of Roman numeral 1, main point A. Hebrew Aramaic terms. And on Wednesday, we moved past the seraphim and we looked at the, uh, the Nahash serpent, the Tanin dragon, the Livyathan terminology, and then the Rahab terminology. All right, so points 11 and 12 were Leviathan and Rahab. Leviathan and Rahab. Rahab is not the Jericho harlot. Rahab is the, uh, the arrogance the arrogance of our adversary and the uh, miniature uh, kingdoms that he establishes when he uh, sets himself up as the power behind the throne and all of the influence that he has over Egypt and Pharaoh and the circumstances there. We'll develop that more under the development. We're simply uh, evaluating things in terms of vocabulary, so we're able to move on. Point 13. The Hebrew is kokav, which is largely is translated star. We understand the angels are called stars. Angels are called stars. And uh, we may come to find out that the <coughs> balls of gas we watch throughout our solar system and galaxy, uh, throughout the physical universe, we call them stars. Uh, we may come to find out that they're actually angels that have been positioned where they've been positioned and have been pursuing their courses this entire time for human observation in any event. 37 uses for Kokab in the Old Testament. Most of those are with reference to stars, in other words, sun, moon, and stars. Uh, but there are places where quite clearly we're not looking at astronomical phenomena. We're actually looking at angelic beings. And this is true in the New Testament as well. Not only the Hebrew vocabulary of Kokab, but also uh, the austere when we get into the Greek You'll see this again in the Greek terminology. So in Judges 5.20, you'll notice the stars fought from heaven and their courses, from their courses, they fought against Sisera. Now there's a lot that's happening in Judges chapter 5 in the human realm, but also in the angelic realm. And one of the things that's tragic about Judges chapter 5 is the failure on the part of Barak. Uh, the failure on the part of, or Barak, if you prefer that pronunciation, all right? The failure on the part of Barak, who is not fulfilling his, his uh, prophetic ministry, his judge responsibility. And so Deborah actually steps up and, uh, and bears the fruit that Barak is supposed to bear. And we have a lot of things that are happening here in this period of Israel's history, including um, turning things upside down in terms of the gender roles and the responsibility. And what's motivating that? What's behind that? Uh, might we expect to see some angelic conflict attack in a context such as that? And so uh, it's interesting as we, as we observe it here. You back up to verse 19. The kings came and fought 
Then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder in silver. So we got the human spectrum there in verse 19. And then in the very next verse, the stars fought from heaven. From their courses, they fought against Sisera. Sisera is the king here. He's going he's gonna to get killed. Uh, it's going to be at the hands of a woman and, a, and uh, so forth. Also, Job 38.7. Job 38.7 is another place where star is used, but it's not a ball of gas in view, all right? It's not a, uh, a source of light and heat energy uh, in the physical universe. The word is star, but the reference applies to a spirit being in the invisible realm of God's creation. Not the physical universe, but the spiritual plane of existence as God created it. Job 38, this is uh, the rebuke of the Lord against Job for putting himself, Job put himself in God's place. And so God basically says, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, if you really are God or know better than me, then tell me how you created everything. Uh, where were you? Where were you? He says, gird up your loins like a man, I will ask you and you instruct me. And this is firmly tongue in cheek. This is sanctified sarcasm at work here. All right, Smarty Pants, pull him up and teach me something is what he says here. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, or since you have understanding. You seem to know everything, or you claim you do. Tell me how you did this. Who set its measurements since you know? Who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? The language here is interesting with plural bases and single cornerstone or single capstone in uh, interesting ways. And with a, with a hung line... Uh, Clarence Larkin, more than 100 years ago, Clarence Larkin thought that the language here uh, was construction language that would be reminiscent of the building of the Great Pyramids. And uh, with, with four bases, we don't have the number four, but we have plural bases, and then a capstone at the top. And a plumb line that would be hung for whatever reason. In any event, that led to Larkin's personal theory that, uh, that Job actually is the architect of the Great Pyramid uh, of Egypt in, in different ways. So... Anyway, I can't prove that, but it is interesting to consider. No question, this is a construction metaphor. And uh, he wants Job to describe how he created the earth. But then we get to verse 7. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. When all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so here we have the use of kokab. We have the use of star as combined with the term for morning which we see in, uh, in a number of different applications. We'll develop this out. Why is uh, Satan called the morning star? Why is he called the light bearer, the Lucifer in Isaiah 14? Why is Jesus called the morning star in some cases? Why uh, are uh, church age believers promised the morning star as a reward in Revelation 2 and 3? What is the uh, entire emphasis here on morning star? Well, these aren't uh, balls of gas in the, in the physical universe. Uh, these are angelic beings, and they're called stars in uh, Job 38.7. It's also important to note that they pre-exist the earth. These angelic beings are older than the earth. They were on hand to witness the creation of the earth. All right, and this comes into our understanding of what usually is mocked or rejected in, in uh, the typical rejection of gap theory. They call it gap theory uh, and so forth when they want to reject it. But as if you've been a part of this ministry for any length of time, or if you've read the ABC reader out there, Plan of God, you'll understand that not only was there a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis 1, but there was a gap inside of verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right? And you've got a period of time in between there within verse 1. All right? And then the earth was formless and void. How did that happen? What caused it to be formless and void? We'll see that in our development here coming up. Alright, so sometimes angels are called stars. In addition to their role as stars, oftentimes the stars are called hosts. The stars are the hosts of heaven. Alright? And so closely related to kokav is the term sabah. Sabah. And you know this anyway because you've sung uh, Lord Sabaoth his name from age to age the same. And every time you sing uh, that hymn in our hymn book, you are singing the plural of Sabah. Uh, Yahweh is Yahweh Tsebayoth, the Lord of hosts. All right, so T-S-A-B-A -A apostrophe. 
close your throat to close the word. Sabah. All right. 6633 is the strongest number. 485 uses. <laughs> we won't look at them all this morning. All right. Um, and typically, it's not li like so many of these terms, not limited to the angelic realm. Oftentimes, it can refer to a human host, an earthly host. But very frequently, it does refer to the heavenly host, in which case uh, they're not uh, astronomical stars. We understand them to be spirit beings. We understand them to be angels, all right? Such as 1 Kings 22, 19, Nehemiah 9, 6, Psalm 103, 21, Psalm 148 in verse 2, as well as Isaiah 24, 21. You're starting to notice a pattern in some of these passages. You're starting to spot many of these are in that apocalypse of Isaiah from chapter 24 to 27, all right? Starting to notice how many of the Psalms contain angelic information, angelic conflict information. 1 Kings 22, do you remember what was happening in that chapter? 1 Kings 22. Remember, 22-22 is not just a road that goes west out of town. Okay? 22-22 in 1 Kings has reference to these spirits that are assembled before his throne. And here's Micaiah the prophet. Micaiah the prophet. And um, <laughs> I mentioned this last week sometime. And, um, in the northern kingdom, of course, you got this unbeliever king. There, were, there was never a good king in the northern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, you had some were good and some were bad. In this case, we got Jehoshaphat, who uh, was a good king, mostly. And uh, the problem was, is he started to, to cooperate and do some things together with the northern king, and that was never good. And uh, in verse 7 of 1 Kings 22, I just highlight this because it makes me laugh every time I read it. Um, Jehoshaphat says, uh, is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Because, see, the king of Israel gathered together all his prophets. The king of Israel in verse 6 gathered all his prophets together, and about 400 of them. But they weren't believers, all right? They weren't prophets of Yahweh. Uh, and so uh, the northern king got his prophets together and asked, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? <laughs> Jehoshaphat wasn't impressed with uh, the, the 400 prophets that the northern king, uh, that Ahab had right there, right? And I love this answer in verse 8. The king uh, uh, of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. <laughs> Isn't that great? All right, so you know if you're coming under some attack and some hatred that you're probably doing your job all right. Uh, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, well, let not the king say so. And so here's Micaiah, the son of Imlah. He's not one of the writing prophets. There's no Old Testament book that was attributed to him, but his ministry here is, is remarkable. And um, he's brought in here to prophesy. And in the process of this, we have this. Now, verse 19, Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven. This is our vocabulary, our sabah, right? Or the plural, sabayuf. All the host of heaven uh, sitting, uh, standing by him on his right and on his left. Now, why are they divided like that? Why, why did, can't they all just get along? Why are they divided left and right? Okay, it's the same reason why sheep and goats are divided left and right, as we start to understand this. And so Yahweh said, who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said this, while another said that. No shortage of volunteers. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. The Lord said to him, How? I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Remember those 400 guys we saw just a few verses ago? Who's energizing them? Where are they getting their words? From these guys. And he, the Lord, said, you are to entice him and also prevail. Go and do so. And so therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these, your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. Pretty bold, don't you think? Here's Micaiah standing against 400. And like Elijah, standing against his 400 <laughs> prophets of Baal. And it uh, doesn't matter. Are you outnumbered? You know? Are we on the losing side of whatever public debate's going on right now? Whatever hot-button issue's happening right now? Oh, well. Stay faithful to the Lord. 
That's the example that we have there. All right, so there's the host. Obviously, the hosts of heaven are not human beings. They're not stars. They are angelic beings. Nehemiah. Nehemiah 9.6. Doug thought that Nehemiah was the shortest guy in the Old Testament. And that, uh, I liked that, but, it, but he was wrong. We, we learned Wednesday night, I wasn't Nehemiah. Our guest speaker on Wednesday night highlighted for us that uh, the shortest man in the Old Testament is Bildad the Shuhite. <laughs> All right. In any event. All right. Nehemiah 9 6. Arise, bless the Lord your God. That's verse 5. Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are Yahweh. You alone. See, true worship will highlight the fact that God and God alone is worthy of worship. You alone are Yahweh. You alone have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts. All right? And this follows the pattern. We saw this in the creation week. He creates the, uh, the, the, the uh, habitat, and then he populates it, right? He creates the, separates the waters from the, uh, the waters above from the waters below. He separates the waters from the dry land. Once he establishes the seas, then he populates the seas. Once he establishes the dry land, here comes the, uh, the, the, the land animals and mankind, all right? And so that is a pattern, I think, holds together with this passage and passages like this, that he has made the heavens. He's also made the heaven of heavens. So you can think of this first heavens as the universe, the physical universe, sun, moon, stars. But then the heaven of heavens is the extra dimensional spirit dimension, where God's throne is established. Of course, that's outside of space and time. You can, you can keep going through the universe and you'll never reach the heaven of heavens. And, and along with the heaven of heavens, all their host, their sabbath. Then also the earth and all that is on it. Remember, God created the heavens. Gap of time. Take a break. And the earth. Okay. Well, this verse tells us that in between there, the heavens and the earth, in between the heavens was then the heaven of heavens and then the host. Then the host. So when were the angels created? Before the earth. Before the earth. All right. The earth and all that is on it. The seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them. And the heavenly host bows down before you. All right. Other than, of course, the rebels, when a third of the angels were swept away by the tail of the dragon, they don't bow down to worship Yahweh. They, in fact, want mankind to bow down and worship them. Part of that insanity of, I will be like the Most High God. In other words, I will be bowed down to and worshipped. Well, there it is. Psalm 103, verse 21. Psalm 103, and verse 21. We back up in context, we see this in verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels. And that's bless Yahweh, you his angels. Mighty in strength. I think we have that coming up for our term mighty. Point 15 is mighty. Um, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Uh, bless the Lord, all you his hosts, plural. How many hosts does he have? You who serve him, doing his will. See, as mighty as they are, as majestic as they are, they're still designed to be servants. They're designed to be servants. They're ministering servants, sent out to render service on your and my behalf. All right. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, and all places of his dominion. That really gets us more into some of the New Testament vocabulary. Rulers, authorities, principalities, powers, the dominions of the angelic realm. Psalm 148, verse 2. All these hallelujahs in the Hebrew, praise the Lord, meaning 
the Yah and Hallelujah is Yahweh. So praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. All right, our term, Sabah. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Praise Him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever, made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, dragons and all deeps, in verse 7. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, and it goes on to the, uh, to the earthly realm. So we have heaven in 1 through 6, and we have earth in 7 through 14. Part of why we're going to see the dragon's original fall was that he was not content with his placement on the original angelic earth. He wanted to raise his throne above the stars of God. And uh, not content with being earthbound, he, uh, part of the things he lusted after, we'll see in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, was uh, what he felt was the improper placement upon the, uh, the angelic earth. Finally, then, Isaiah 24, 21. You know, were the terrestrial angels less than the heavenly angels? You know, the seraphim that get to stand before God's throne day and night and sing the holy, holy, holy. Uh, Satan was not content with where his position was. And yet he was the pinnacle. He was the pinnacle. This whole insanity of his rebellion is a failure to identify that uh, when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you at the proper time. Jesus Christ came not to be served, but to serve. And that servant role, that servant capacity that Satan had, the pinnacle of the servanthood, he hated it. And we see as the basis for all the systems of evil that are out there that are motivating for the, uh, the self-exaltation the way that they are. All right, Isaiah 24. Um... Boy, where to pick up on this? Um, terror, let's see, terror in a pit, the snare in verse 17. Um, well, let's see. I'm tempted to read the whole chapter, but we can't do that. <laughs> um, let's just understand that uh, this is, it's, called, it's the beginning of Israel's, of Isaiah's little apocalypse, it's 24 through 27. And there is a ton in here that not only addresses the human realm, but also the angelic realm. So, verse 19, the earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. Remember, this earthquake in the days of Uzziah was so global, I mean, it was so unbelievable, they were still talking about it centuries later, that it affected their, their calendar globally, it affected a lot of things, it affected... Um, we're going to see how it, it touched upon even the angelic realm. You say, how could an earthquake touch the angelic realm? Well, when the powers of the heavens are shaken, that's an expression we have to identify with. All right. So the windows above were opened, the foundations of the earth shake. That's verse 18. You got both heavenly effects and earthly effects. It'll happen again in the tribulation, by the way. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. So the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack, for its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall, never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on the earth. Now what's that dynamic all about? Why, why is there dual punishment going on with the host of heaven and then the kings of the earth? Okay, Pay attention, because we'll have more on this when we get to the king terminology here very quickly. Human governments are, uh, uh, they're not calling the shots, all right? And you don't have to be, uh, uh, who's that? Rick? No, don't tell me. Uh, there's this guy on the radio that's kind of popular in certain circles that believes every conspiracy that's ever, ever come along. You don't have to believe half the stuff he believes, all right? I don't need human conspiracies to understand the angelic conflict. How about we start with the angelic conspiracies, all right? We know the God of this age rules this world. He offered it to Jesus on one condition that Jesus bow down and worship him. But he runs this world. 
And there is a fallen angel assigned to every human government. The prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, the prince of Babylon, all right? And we're going to see this. Here we have them linked as well. It's not just Daniel 10 when this shows up. Here we have the punishment of the hosts of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon, will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. Satan will be bound in the abyss for a thousand years, but he won't be thrown into the lake of fire until the end of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. <clears throat> the dead will not live, the, the departed spirits, the Rephaim, okay, we'll have this vocabulary coming up, the giants that were the demonic offspring of the fallen angels and human women. They will not rise. Therefore you have punished and destroyed them and you have wiped out all remembrance of them. Okay? Different things here. And then you got the, you've got the pregnant woman writhing in labor pains, the things that we know are associated with Armageddon and the, the end times wrath of God's wrath on Gentiles and Jews in the tribulation. You've got uh, the dead living, the corpses rising. You've got the departed spirits mentioned again in verse 19. All right. Hmm. That's a chapter that needs development, don't you think? All right. Term 15. Term 15. We're not giving you development. We're simply highlighting vocabulary this morning. Abir, mighty, valiant. Angels are called mighty ones. They're called mighty ones. And we've seen that already in some of the El and Elohim terminology where they're translated as God or Prince or Mighty One. But here is a term for might. Abir. A-B-B-I-Y-R. And actually started with the apostrophe before the A. Abir. You gotta, you gotta like the ancient honest, you gotta have that silent throat closure in the front of Abir. Strong's number 47, there's 17 uses in the Old Testament. Speaks of the mighty and valiant being. Psalm 78 is a good example. We had another example just a few minutes ago in a different psalm. Not on the slide, but we were just looking at it. In Psalm 103, I think. Here's uh, Psalm 78, 25. Man did eat the bread of angels. The bread of the mighty ones. You know, who delivered this bread every morning anyway? Where did it come from? How did it get there? What is it? Okay? So they called it, what is it? They called it manna, which is Hebrew for what is it? All right? <laughs> I know he who sits in the heavens laughs. He laughs because we're so ridiculous. <laughs> we look at his glorious grace provision and we call it, what is it? You know? Man. So, uh, isn't this interesting? Therefore, the Lord heard, verse 21, and you see all of their rebellion. These are the people that he's redeeming. These are the people that he's bringing out of bondage. The people who walked through the, the Red Sea on dry ground. And they're grumbling and rebelling and they're stubborn. They continue to sin. And, uh, oh, it's horrible. So therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath and a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also mounted against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. This is a redeemed people who failed to believe. All right, a redeemed people. They're already out of bondage. They've passed through the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness now. They're on the way to the promised land and they stop believing. Okay. That's why the unbelief of the believer is a huge thing we better be on guard against. Because you and I are redeemed people. And we'll never go back to our bondage and sin. We'll never go back to being unbelievers. You cannot lose your salvation. But you can walk in unbelief. You can stop walking by faith. You can grumble and perish in the wilderness like they did. Alright? That's the warning that we have in the book of Hebrews and we see it spelled out here. Yet he commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. All right? He commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. That's where this bread came from. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. 
Man did eat the bread of the mighty, the valiant, the mighty ones, the abirim. Okay? Floral for abir. He sent them food in abundance. And there's more that we'll look at related to that, but there's, there's the uh, faith. And even then they grumble, right? They're, they're getting bread from heaven. <laughs> uh, we're tired of all this manna. We want meat. We want quail. All right, they are mighty, they are also holy. They're called holy ones. Holy ones. Kadoshim, the Hebrew kadosh, is our term for holy. And so kadoshim are holy ones. We've got to be cautious with this, though. Sometimes it applies to angels. Sometimes it does uh, could apply to you and to I, correct? You and I are saints by calling. We are a hagioi in the New Testament. The, the Greek for, for kadoshim is hagioi, saints. And so in a New Testament perspective, it applies to us. It applies to believers. Now here is where we end up with some questions, as it were, because some of the second advent prophecies are that the Lord is going to descend with myriads of his holy ones. So are those angels? Well, from the standpoint of the Hebrew, Kedoshim, and the prophecies as originally given, yes, those are angelic references. But when they're cited in the New Testament and the Lord returns with many of his saints, are those angels? Or could they apply to us? Could they apply to you and to me? Because thus we shall always be with the Lord. And we're told that we shall judge this world. We shall judge even the angels, we're told. We ourselves are called saints by calling. All right, Kedoshim, Q-E-D-O-W-S-H-I-Y-M, Kedoshim. I superscript that first E because it's the Shawa, it's a short vowel. So try to rush through it. Kedoshim. 6918 is the strongest number. 116 uses. We could be here all day looking at Kedoshim, okay, or Kadosh. Most of the places where we find Kadosh, we find us describing God himself. God is holy. You were to be holy for I am holy. It's the term for holiness. But beings of holiness, who were they? Well, for the most part, they're, uh, they're angels. All right? Psalm 89, verses 5 and 7. Psalm 89, verses 5 and 7. Job 5, 1. We actually seen a couple of these in some previous vocabulary verses looking at uh, some different terms. Job 89. Verse 5 says, The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the Kadoshim, the assembly of the Holy Ones. What is their assembly? What is their worship? We know when they're organized into a host, those are angels going forth in their soldier function. But when they are gathered in their assembly, or their congregation, they're gathered together for their priestly function. All right? We're not the only ones with ambassadorial, soldier, and priestly function. They likewise had similar roles in their own stewardship. Verse uh, 6, For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty? The B'nai Elohim, right? Or the B'nai El. Who among the sons of the mighty is like Yahweh, is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the counsel of his Kedoshim, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is like you, O mighty Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Alright? Not only mighty, not only powerful, but faithful. Faithful. It's a powerful song, alright? John Eichmann starts most of his sermons quoting those verses. Those very verses right there. Alright, Job 5.1. Job, Job, Job. Going the wrong way. Job is before Psalms. 5.1. The second part of Eliphaz's rebuke, his first rebuke, it starts in chapter 4. <coughs> Eliphaz the Temanite answered in chapter 4 and then starts to describe certain things. You remember that much of what he's describing is demonic. We spotted this uh, a couple classes ago when we saw in chapter 4... Uh, in verse 12, a word was brought to me stealthily. My ear received a whisper of it. Amid disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, dread came upon me in trembling and made all my bones shake. 
Then a spirit passed by my face. The hair of my flesh bristled up. Okay? We looked at this and we gave you the vocabulary of Ruch, the spirit. Not every spirit is from God. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. And then I heard a voice. And remember, this was all demonic. This was all negative. Can mankind be just before God? Can man, can man be pure before his maker? You puny human. You will never measure up to God. He puts no trust even in his servants. Against his angels he charges error. Oh, boo-hoo, woe is us. <laughs> right? And if we can't measure up, you mortal dust creature cockroaches have no chance in the world. Against his angels he charges there, how much more those who dwell in <clears throat> houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. All right? You see the scorn in this? The fallen angels that are just uh, whispering through Eliphaz, giving him a message to go and condemn Job with. And so it continues into chapter 5. Call now. Is there anyone who will answer you? To which of the Kedoshim will you turn? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Now right here is part of the problem. We don't call upon any of the holy ones. We don't call upon any angel. We don't pray to any angel. We don't worship any angel. We don't call upon any angel. In Kiev, Ukraine, they believe that the Archangel Michael is the patron saint of their city. And they call upon Michael to preserve them. The very same Archangel Michael, by the way, that our Bible tells us is the Prince of Israel. Is the, is the angel assigned to protect Israel. But Kiev believes, and they have since, uh, I think Stephen I, they have for since 1000 AD, that uh, the Archangel Michael is their protector. All right. Which uh, he hasn't done a very good job with. I know Kiev's been sacked repeatedly. <laughs> okay including three times in World War II alone. Different aspects there. Anyway, um, so to which of the angels will you turn? To which of the angels will you turn? Is there anyone who will answer you? Which of the holy ones will you turn? Here's a problem. If you're calling out to an angel, that's problem number one. And if you get an answer back, that's problem number two. Okay? Because that's not coming from the Lord. That's one of these fallen angels that uh, is going to be whispering satanic darkness into your soul. Job 15, a few chapters back. Job 15, 15. Hmm. Eliphaz again. And notice he's not letting go of this. Hmm. It's interesting. Here's Eliphaz, and he's got it backwards. You do away with reverence, he tells Job, and you hinder meditation before God. Your guilt teaches your mouth, and you choose the language of the crafty. I don't remember this or not, but we looked at this verse when we were dealing with craftiness, deception. Okay? The language of the crafty. But Eliphaz himself is the one uttering the language of the crafty. And he comes down here and he says, uh, uh, in verse 12, you're... Your, why does your heart carry you away? Why do your eyes flash that you should turn your spirit against God and allow such words to go out of your mouth? What is man that he should be pure? Or he who was born of a woman that he should be righteous? Okay? You know, raise your hand if your mom was a woman. <laughs> okay? All right. In Adam, he is correct. All of us are totally depraved and we need salvation. Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones. And the heavens are not pure in his sight. Ten chapters later, he's still repeating that, that satanic message he got in the, in the night visions from chapter 5 or chapter 4. How much less one who is detestable and corrupt, <coughs> man who drinks iniquity like water. <laughs> All right. Little hints here as well. Verse 9, by the way. Let's see. Verse 7, were you the first man to be born? Were you brought forth before the hills? Do you hear the secret counsel of God and limit wisdom to yourself? Remember, these are the first generations after the flood. 
the very early generations after Noah's flood, Noah and his sons are still alive. And um, what do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that we do not? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. Okay, and we get little hints and glimpses here as to the time setting for the book of Job. I believe we place it two generations prior to Abraham in, the, uh, in that patriarchal era of the Gentiles. All right, enough on that. Zechariah 14.5. Zechariah 14, 5. Why don't I go to Zechariah and then Daniel? I don't know. Must have had a reason. Zechariah 14, 5. This is when the Lord descends. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's why this can't be rapture. In rapture, his feet don't land on the earth. In rapture, he descends to the clouds. We meet the Lord in the air. But this verse tells us, Zechariah 14, 4, that he, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. It's the very mountain that he ascended from. They told the disciples that on, the, on, the, uh, on his ascension day, that the Lord would return to the same spot that he took off from. Agreement here with Zechariah 14, 4. And, uh, which is in the front of Jerusalem, on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from the east to the west, by a very large valley, so that half the mountain will move to the north, half the other half toward the south. And so there's a new valley now. It didn't used to be there, but there it is. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Ezel. Yes, you will flee, just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. See, they're still talking about that earthquake in the days of Uzziah. But this is a, a, a once more that's going to cause the earth and the heavens to shake and to tremble. Then Yahweh, my God, will come and all the Kedoshim with him. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. All right? Sun, moon, and stars, it's all going to grow dark. I think it's because the angels get new assignments. They get repositioned. And they're coming with, with Christ to conquer in the uh, Armageddon campaign. Finally, then Daniel 8, twice in verse 13. We have it in Daniel chapter 8. Oh, yeah. I yeah, put it off to the end because I wanted to put it off to the end. <laughs> that was intentional. All right. That was deliberate. That was deliberate. Get my movie quote right. Um, Daniel 8, 13. You'll notice um, this is part of the vision when Daniel is receiving things that are going to take place in the tribulation and the scene shifts back and forth repeatedly. There's a vision on the earth and it goes to heaven. A vision back on the earth and back to heaven. And we're shifting back and forth when this Antichrist, this little horn, is, is uh, boasting and so forth. And um, verse 9, Out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall down to the earth and it trampled them down. How does a human king defeat angels like this? All right? You know, you read Caesar's Gallic Wars and how he conquered the French. Okay? Not hard to do. Everyone does. Or you, you read about um, Alexander the Great and his conquests. You read about um, Nebuchadnezzar and his conquests. How is this horn throwing down the heavenly host and the stars? trampling them down, even magnifying itself to be equal with the commander of hosts. Remember, he is the pinnacle of Satan's program. He is the pinnacle of the anti-Christ. All right? You substitute Messiah. And this is now his hero of the ages. All right? Doug? All right. For Fred? We've got different code names for Fred. All right. Even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. 
Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking. So now Daniel becomes a great eavesdropper in between two kedoshim, in between two holy ones. And they've got questions about how this is going to be fulfilled and how long this is going to last. How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place we properly restore. All right, so when we do our eschatology, when we do our studies of the, of the tribulation and the Armageddon campaign and all the various battles that take place, understand it's not entirely human. It's not entirely human. There will be great angelic components to the warfare. Many of the, uh, many of the humans actually are going to be themselves demonic. They're going to be demoniacs. As the, as the abyss is opened and the 200 million demons are unleashed out of the abyss. All right? Different things that we're going to have to look at related to that. So Kedoshim, holy ones. Holy ones. And it kind of seems like they're losing for much of the, uh, much of the process here. Okay. That can't be good. <laughs> that can't be good. I mean, think about the age of grace we live in. I'm very thankful that we still live in the age of grace. I'm very thankful that the angels are uh, not yet being trampled under. Which takes us now to our two political terms. Oh, no, wait, I reorganized this, didn't I? Okay. Let's start with Chaya. I added a 17 in there. Chaya, followed by Sar, followed by Melech. And we'll see how far we get with this. Awkward teaching without a clock. That's okay. We've got 13 minutes left. We'll, we'll hit it hard. All right. Chaya. Living beings. Living beings. And we spent a fair amount of time on this when we looked at the cherubim. All right. We looked at the cherubim and we had a whole class on cherubim. And then I even followed up on a Sunday morning with additional things from Ezekiel 1 that I felt we didn't handle very well from Ezekiel 10. All right? And every time we have the chaya, or the plural chayim, that's used, we, it's, it's obviously not in the human realm because they're parallel to the cherubim. And so we see this, and it's pretty unique to Ezekiel, at least until they're unfolded in, again in Revelation 4 and 5. But in Ezekiel, chapter 1, we have them here. Verse 5, verse 13, 14, 15, 19, 20, 21, 22. And some of those had double uses. 13, 15, and 19 all had double uses in those, in those verses. And this is where Ezekiel sees the, the vision of Yahweh in his traveling chariot. All right? And you might expect, you might expect Ezekiel's discouragement. You might expect um, the questions that he might have as this book opens up. Ezekiel starts, he's about 30 years of age as this opens up. 30 is when he should be starting his priestly service. He's of a priestly family. He should be starting his priestly service, but he won't. He'll never have priestly service because he's in Babylon. He's among the captives. That His temple's destroyed. And he might have these questions about, you know, how are God's promises going to be fulfilled? How is His eternal covenant going to be fulfilled? Is He going to bring us back after 70 years, like Jeremiah said? And does God's sovereignty end because I'm out of that land? David's no longer on His throne. The son of David is no longer on the Davidic throne. The temple is destroyed. There's no more holy of holies. There's no more glory. Ezekiel's actually going to see the glory depart from the temple. And so in this first chapter, it's remarkable that the first thing that he sees when he's called to ministry, not called to priestly ministry, he's called to prophetic ministry, and the vision where he's called to prophetic ministry, he's summoned to duty by the Lord on his battle chariot, on his traveling chariot. God's sovereignty is not limited to the boundaries of Israel, that he can mount his chariot and travel, and, and um, of course he's omnipresent, we get that. But in this vision here, I think it's important that Yahweh visits him on his battle chariot. All right. And so it's in the midst of this. Verse 4, I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north with a great cloud and fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And in its midst, something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire, 
Within it were figures resembling four living beings. And this is our term, our chaya, the chayim, all right? The living beings. And uh, this was their appearance. They had human forms. Or are these living beings human? No, because they have human form. You don't describe a human with human form. You describe something that's not human with human form, if that's the form that it has. Like what we're going to see also when uh, uh, Satan is promised you're going to die like men. Those aren't men that are being told they're going to die like men. Okay? You don't tell men they're going to die like men. You tell something that's not men that they're going to die like men, if they're going to die like men. All right. Um, human form. And then we're going to see that they have four faces. They have wings. They have this other description here. The face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of a bull, the face of an eagle. Now these are cherubim. But they're called living beings. Every one of these chaya references is parallel to cherubim. Verse 13, you got two more. In the midst of the living beings was something like, that looked like burning coals of fire. Torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, lightning flashed from the fire. And by the time you get down to chapter 10, verse 15, verse 17, verse 20, we, we have it locked in that these cherubim are the living beings from chapter 1. All right? These cherubim, these chaya, these living beings. And this is, to me, extraordinary. They have a chaya life which um, even in our development we don't have a whole lot of information on and so sometimes we have to uh, content ourselves to say, you know what, the, the development doesn't seem to have a whole lot more than the vocabulary gave us. <laughs> All right? Sometimes that's going to be the case. Um, but with this classification of spirit beings, though, they have a chaya life that some of the other angels don't have. All right? or They have a zoe life, the zoan life that are they're described as Zoan in uh, Revelation. Not every angel has that. Why do these angels have that? Okay. Why do they need that? If they're spirit beings, why do they have life that connects to this mortality the way our life connects? Eve has her name based on this word, this Chaya. She's called Chava Eve because she's the mother of all the living. I, I assume that excludes these guys. Okay? Because these guys were around before the, the earth was created. But in Ezekiel 10, 15, uh, we're told specifically the cherubim rose up. These are the living beings, the chaya that I saw by the river of Kabar. In other words, back in chapter 1. Back in chapter 1. And they're mentioned there in chapter 10, verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 15, verse 17, and verse 20. All right. Now, I've only got seven minutes left, but let's go to Daniel 10, and let's get some introduction here to the princes and to the kings. To the princes and to the kings. Daniel chapter 10. And, and all I can do is just tease you with this, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back to it Wednesday night. Lord willing, rapture pending. If, the, if we hear a trumpet, by the way, and we, we get raptured out of here, then I'm officially retired. I will no longer be your pastor. <laughs> All right, we will have the good, the great, and the chief shepherd as our, uh, as our Lord. All right, Daniel 10. Now, does it bother you that princes are higher than kings? Okay, because in most English uses, uh, as it's come down through our understanding, anyway, in the English language, the British monarchy and so forth, uh, the king is the one on the throne, and his sons are the princes, and daughters are the princesses. All right, and a prince is uh, waiting for the king to die so that he can become the next king, right? That's, I mean, that's how we normally think about it. Uh, in the Hebrew, Sar is higher than Melech. Sar is higher than Melech. And we've got different terms that we can use for the sons of the king. Uh, there's other ways that we can distinguish between those that are under kings. But a Sar, it bothers me that a lot of English renderings will bring Sar in as a prince I think we could do better than that. We could do like Caesar. We could do like Tsar, the Russian Tsar. 
we could do um, a lot better uh, with the uh, the Hebrew sar than uh, Prince, but that's what we got. All right, <laughs> eighty-two sixty-nine is the Strong's number with uh, four hundred and eleven uses. Most of them are not angelic. All right, the bulk of them are in the human realm. But in the handful of places where they cannot be in the human realm, we understand them for what they are. They are angelic references. And a prince, singular, has sovereignty over an individual earthly nation. But then we have multiple kings under him. Multiple kings under him. And so a, a czar or a Caesar, uh, the, the emperor, as it were, the Roman emperor, would have, other, would have kings under him. Okay, Queen Cleopatra was, was a subject of Julius Caesar. All right, and then a subject of Augustus Caesar, Octavian, until she killed herself. All right, uh, King Herod was another client king. There was a king of the Nabataeans, subject to Caesar, subject to Rome. There was a king uh, in Western Africa. Jugurtha was a king, for example, subject to Rome until he rebelled, and then you have, you know, the, the African war that took place there. Um, other client kings. And this was part of, I think, this was motivated on the part of Satan, who said, I will be like the Most High God, who loved being able to call himself a king of kings, who loved to be able to call himself a czar, a ruler, oh, with kings subject to him. If nothing else, then to continue his, his fantasy of being like the Most High God and to replicate the promises that the coming one would indeed be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we'll notice here, and let's just close with this. In Daniel 10, the term is used in verse 13, <coughs> verse 20, and verse 21. And what happens is, is Gabriel gets, um, he gets... Kidnapped. He's on his way to encourage Daniel, and he gets abducted between heaven and Daniel. And it says here, um, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this, and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. From that very first day. Well, that was 21 days ago. What took you so long? Normally, when, when Gabriel departs from the Father's throne in the morning, by the morning sacrifices, he can make it by the evening sacrifices. Okay? However that works. However fast angels fly and they flap their wings and whatever. All right? Traveling from, uh, from God's throne to Daniel is typically from morning and he's there by evening. That's their commute. Okay? This time it took 21 days. So what, what happened there? Well, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, chief princes, okay, and you compound the, uh, the uh, Tsar there, like Michael is the only one called Archangel, by the way. But here he's one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings, plural, kings of Persia. And so what we conclude is, is that this prince of Persia defeated Gabriel, defeated him in battle, took him prisoner, and left him in the custody of his subordinates, left him in the custody of these kings, plural. Kings of Persia. So there's one prince, there's multiple kings, and none of these guys are Cyrus, who's a believer. <laughs> All right? Daniel, by this time, has led Cyrus to a saving knowledge of the, of the Jewish Messiah. All right, so stay tuned. And we're going to see in verse 20, there's a prince of Greece who's on his way. And then in verse 21, Michael is your prince. We assign Michael to the role of Israel. The role of Israel comes up again in chapter 12. Michael is your prince. No one else will stand with Gabriel to defend Israel. But uh, Daniel 12, 1 says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. So, what about the United States? Who's the Prince of America? Okay. We don't know. We don't have names assigned to him. But we better be aware of the fact that uh, there's a Prince of America and there's a King of Texas. And where do you think he lives? 
Is he happy having this Bible church right here teaching this stuff today? <coughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Father, for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness. Continue to open our eyes and humble us, Father. Help us to see the where Eliphaz went wrong listening to those whisperings. Keep us from listening to any kind of whisperings, Father. Just keep us humble looking to you. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.